Hi everyone, welcome back to the Technology Room. Um, our next session is brought to us by Michelle Lomond from Southwest, Southwest TAFE in Victoria, Australia. Uh, Michelle is going to show us how to get the most from H5P in Moodle. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, as always, post them in the forum and we'll try and get to them at the end of the presentation. Michelle's also going to jump in and respond to any as she can. Um, welcome, Michelle. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to Melbourne, Victoria, Australia, where it is currently 9 p.m. So that means it has to be story time. So I hope you're ready for a good story because once upon a time in a land far, far away, down under, there was a girl who fell madly in love with Moodle. And wherever the girl went, Moodle went too. That is actually kind of handy during what we're experiencing, the zombie apocalypse at the moment. So the girl spends every day with Moodle and turns out her job is to make Moodle magic. And that includes making Moodle courses and activities. And these days, a lot of that magic includes using H5P. Now, as it turns out, one of the positive things about a zombie apocalypse is that since March, the requests for Moodle magic has actually tripled. <laughs> Go figure. So in this Moodle site that we're going to look at today, there's now over 800 H5P activities. So let's go explore some of them. The really cool thing about H5P is that you can either have it as a sequence of activities and content, or you can get rid of the old SCORM and you can have it as a, uh, a package in its own or a module. And so on this screen, for instance, you're seeing some examples of H5P used for staff training. And some of those are sequences and some of them are individual modules that staff undertake. But let's go and explore some of my favorite H5P tools. Now the column tool has actually turned out to be my top favorite. Now, if you are someone who tends to develop in uh, say Rise or Adapt, uh, you'd be quite familiar with this sort of layout. So particularly good these days for a lot of users uh, on the smaller screens where scrolling is a lot easier for them than say flipping pages. So in the column tool in H5P, you can actually put together uh, a sequence of activities and content and you can put it in any sequence that you like. So in this case, this one uh, came from a beauty course. And on the, the next slide we're looking at, this is from a tourism course. And as I said, you can sequence things in any order you like, and it can be good for things like, uh, so tourism wanted to ask a, a whole bunch of questions and a quiz, well, they can get overwhelming after a while. So this was great because we could use some question sets so that users could tackle little chunks um, rather than being overwhelmed by a huge screen full of questions. And in this example from uh, Beauty, and I'd have to say if hair and beauty and nursing and the other practical courses that we're looking at can use Moodle during the zombie apocalypse, then any course can leverage online. So in this particular case, students view a video and then underneath it are a sequence of questions and you can have a whole bunch of different question types in there. And some of the, the different content types or activity types that you might want to put in there include, in this case, we have some flashcards, uh, which we're going to have a look at a little bit later on, and also followed up by an essay question, which is one of my favorite tools in H5P now. Um, so we will focus on that one uh, coming up as well. So as I said, you can have a whole bunch of different types of, of questions in a column. And uh, when you do that, you'll then have the option in the back end of a whole bunch of different settings. So you can control settings for individual questions as well as for the entire um, column tool as well, which makes it really powerful and quite flexible as well. One of my other favorite tools has to be the course presentation. So if you're a fan of the old SCORM package, then the course presentation tool might be a good one for you, whereas the column was really good for if you're into rise and adapt and, and like the scrolling. So course presentation, 
as um, I was looking at earlier, can be a sequence of activities, or you can have it just as one single package. So we're going to have a look at a use here where it was actually used um, to create like a gaming type experience. So each level of the game used different types of H5P tools. So this allows you to actually look at the learning outcomes um, and have some variety. So you don't have that boredom, but you also have consistency as well. So in this level, I've used some drag and drop. Um, and what I would recommend if you're going to do something like this is if you've got access to a good range of vector images, it's going to make your life a lot simpler. In the next level, uh, some different question types <clears throat> have been used. And the cool thing here is that you can have different types of questions and you can have a, a slide background to provide a little bit more interest. Now, I usually fade out my background images and uh, you can also control the opacity of the question as well. So a little bit of, of white behind the question to provide a little bit more contrast between your background image and your question. And uh, you can also see that you've got quite a few ways of navigating by using course presentation as well. Now in the third level of this game, um, different content tool again. And in this particular case, the users had to look at some different uh, email examples. And so there were 10 different emails and they had to identify whether they were real or scam. But a lot easier than, well, you would think it would be easier than it actually was. And so I've allowed people to retry this as well. And uh, again, enabling them to navigate a, a few different ways. Now, in this version of a course presentation, I actually chose to put a series of questions all on the same slide. Um, now, I don't often do this, but it provides a little bit of variety throughout the course presentation. And they were very short questions. And I purposely chose the true-false question type because it allowed me to put the, the feedback directly on the screen. And in this particular case, the feedback was really important and was part of the, the learning journey. And so once again, you can see we've got lots of different ways of people navigating. And we've also got the full screen option, which is really handy as well. On this one, uh, drag and drop came into play. Now, a couple of tips when you're doing some drag and drop. Uh, on the top right, I've got a, a full screen button option for the drag and drop as well. One tip with that, don't put your drop zones over the top of uh, where that button would appear because otherwise the button looks like it's going to work, but it actually doesn't because it's been covered. Uh, the other tip with drag and drop is to play with the display settings because uh, you want to maximize your screen size, but you don't want users having to actually scroll. So you might have to do a little bit of playing around with your image sizes and uh, the H5P tool has a display setting size as well. Now, the other option in a course presentation, um, we were looking at some different question pipes before. So here it's a, a question set, uh, which is really good for um, minimizing the number of slides you have to have in your course presentation. The only thing is there's always one cherub in every group of students. You know them, you've had them, and they're the one that don't realize that there's actually more than one question on your slide. So you may want to provide a little prompt there just to remind them that uh, there might be four or five questions that they happen to be answering. And one of the other really powerful tools happens to be Scenario. Now, if you've ever used the lesson tool in Moodle, um, this one will be relatively familiar to you. It's quite powerful. The only caveat or, or downside to that would be that you've got to do a little bit of planning first. Um, so if we take a look at what that entails in the back end of scenario. So what you need to do is work out what pathway do you want learners to take? Now, the really great thing about scenario, like column or course presentation, you can actually include a variety of different H5P activity types and content types in here. But you don't have the full range, so do be aware of that. But it does also allow you to bring in content, say from Photoshop or some animations in there as well. Uh, I would recommend that you do work out 
um, let's say, do you want them to definitely get the answer right before they can move on? So for instance, if we were to compare that with on the left here, we have the Moodle lesson, um, so the back end setting that up. And then on the right here, we have the H5P scenario back end. So it's actually quite similar, um, similar learning curve. But in both cases, you need to figure out what pathway do you want people to take? And I would say to you, when you're setting either of them up, use meaningful names when you set up the, the varying pages in those or slides in, in the scenario case, because you're going to have to link to them and you want to know uh, which one you're actually linking to. You can outsmart yourself pretty quickly, always fun. Uh, now, one of my new favorite H5P activity types is the essay. So most of us are really big fans of Moodle quiz, for instance, and, and Moodle lesson, etc. Probably one of the things um, as teachers that we don't enjoy doing is marking. And with us doing a lot more online uh, learning with our students, it gets a bit onerous if we're marking everything. So the cool thing about the essay tool is you can take questions where you want the students to type in answers and you can have Moodle mark it for you, winning. So for instance, in the top right there, uh, let's say that you've got a question where there's potentially 10 different answers and you'd, you'd accept any of them. But let's say that you want the learner to type in five correct responses uh, for them to get a, a tick for that. So all we do is we tell Moodle, hey, here's the question, here's 10 potential answers that can get a tick and you can tell it as long as they get five of those, they're going to get a tick for that. Um, and the cool thing is that we can then say, so you can see here that the show solution button then becomes available. So you can control when that does become available. I mean, I said it once they got everything right, that they can then have a look at, hey, here were the other five that you could have used as well. So it is a really cool tool. If we unpack this a, a little bit further, a um, couple of tips when you're setting up a, an essay, uh, it will ask you for a title. And for any question, um, whether it be an essay or multiple choice question, anytime you've got questions uh, built into H5P, I do recommend you put some meaningful names for your questions. A uh, couple of reasons for that. Uh, when you go to link to something or you're reordering something, if they're not titled, they don't mean anything to you. And again, you've outsmarted yourself. Learned that the hard way. The other reason is the uh, summary slide. So on a lot of these tools like course presentation, for instance, um, you will have a summary slide. Now, if you don't name your questions well, then on the summary slide, they just come up as untitled and that's really not helpful to the learner or to you when you're going in and reviewing things. So to set up the essay question, we pop in the name uh, of the question in the task description. We tell the learner, here's the question, here's what I want you to do. And in this case, I've popped in the sample solution that will pop up for them as well. Now, also when you happen to be setting this one up, you're asked for keywords. Now, there's a couple of ways you can use this. And again, I'm really good at outsmarting myself setting this one up. Uh, so tips from the, the one who has mucked it up many times. So one way is to say, for instance, in this case, we've got four things that we're looking for. There's four things, keywords that we want the learner to type in. They could be words, they could be phrases. Um, and the good thing about this is for each one of those four, we can put in some variations. So let's say that it doesn't have to be the exact phrase or we know they often misspell something. You can put in some variations for that. Um, the alternative to that, let's say that um, going back to the example of there were 10 possible answers, um, we only need five. Uh, I would stick all of them into one of these little keyword cards and put all 10 into there. Uh, and the reason for that is that in the settings, you can then say that there are five occurrences that I'm looking for. So we can see on the left here that I could change the occurrences to five. So it would then look for, hey, did they get five of the 10? The other couple of settings on that one, I usually uh, disable case sensitive, unless you have a very good reason to, to otherwise change that. And I have my weak moments where apparently I'm a little bit nice and I enable forgive minor mistakes, just in case they have a bit of a, a quirky moment and they haven't typed it in quite correctly. 
on the right hand side I tend to do things like say how many characters they need to type in and the reason I do that is so that they can't just hit the check button okay see I'm mean so I make them type something in at the very least before they can um, progress further the other thing I use is the input field size so there's two reasons for manipulating that number one maximize your screen size so if you have everything set to, to 10 lines you're not going to get a lot in before they're scrolling and the second reason is that it helps the learner to, to basically understand how much of an answer are you looking for are you looking for a short phrase or are you looking for a paragraph of text and uh, the bottom there on the right I always articulate what is the passing percentage that I'm after um, in this case it was a hundred percent and then a very popular tool interactive video now it's very cool so you can take a YouTube video for instance or one you create yourself and you can specify that at certain points in time the video will pause and a question will pop up now a couple of tips with this one is uh, when you add a question you've got two ways of it appearing uh, by default it's a button and I have found that sometimes learners miss the button and so I always set mine to be poster which is the version that you're seeing on the screen um, there's a whole bunch of different question types that you can add in there which is really cool and what I also love is on the right there let's say um, if you think back to your classroom delivery I know it seems like a really long time ago now work with me that you're showing a video and often you would pause that and you would provide some commentary to that so what you can do in here is rather than asking a question you can actually provide some text uh, the other thing I tend to do with interactive video is I stop the, <laughs> the letter from fast forwarding uh, I told you I mean so what I do is I, I basically force it that it they start the video keeps going reaches a question pauses they answer the question continues on etc the, the big tip though is to make sure that you do specify again your summary slide because you want the score to count but the great thing is that summary slide doesn't actually have to be at the end of the video it can be halfway through the video if that's all you need um, so it's a really cool feature for you to leverage of specifying when is it all wrapped up now as good as interactive video is it may not always be the best choice so let's say you've got a, a great video and you want to ask a series of questions some of them are self-marking but perhaps you would like to use that essay type question now that can be a bit awkward when you're trying to put big questions into a video so in this case it was using the column tool with the video at the top and then a series of questions following that Now, hopefully you're not feeling like this by this point in time as you know it's 9 30 at night here at Melbourne so have another sip of coffee nothing that can't be fixed by caffeine and let's keep exploring question set is a really cool tool you want to quickly add a set of questions to a Moodle course it's an option instead of using the Moodle quiz you don't have to um, in this case here we've used it for a, a beauty course now if you do have a question set of course there's always um, some options both for each question and for the entire tool as well if you're new to h5p I would say stick with the default settings see how that looks then change one setting and then see how it looks um, otherwise you could again outsmart yourself drag and drop really visual really engaging um, really popular with teachers and learners uh, again if you've got good access to uh, some images that really helps on the left here we've got an example from a nursing course and so this was instead of always being text-based so this allows them to um, say to the learner drag the process into the right order um, using images and on the right was from a first aid module um, identifying just by dragging and dropping the critters as to how to treat them some other drag and drop options here we've got one from tourism and uh, another one from hair and beauty and a couple of tips again uh, so I talked about having good sources of images but also compress your images down be nice when it comes to bandwidth and the other tip is 
don't have too many drag and drop options. It gets very overwhelming and bear in mind that they might be on a smaller screen size than you are. And uh, again, watch out for the full screen size that you make sure that with that full screen button that you don't put your uh, drop zones over the top of that. Again, unless you don't like the learner. And the other tip with drag and drop. Uh, so for instance, here, the learner had to drag the um, items into the correct disposal bin. Um, now you could actually say that items could go into multiple bins. I chose not to in this case because the downside of that is when you drag something, yes, it appears in, in the drop zone, but it still remains um, where you took it from, which can become a little bit confusing as to which ones you've completed. Drag the words. So very similar to the drag and drop that we've looked at, uh, but quicker and easier to set up. Uh, the only thing where you can outsmart yourself here, uh, not that I would know of course, is you could have an ambiguous answer. So that simply means that one of these answers could potentially live in more than one spot. Now that's okay if you meant that to happen, uh, but often it happens when you didn't mean it to happen. <laughs> Just fake it till you make it if that happens. That's the only thing to watch out for with that one. Hotspots is another really interactive, engaging visual uh, tool. So for instance, here, uh, again, this came from Hair and Beauty where they wanted to have a very simple manual handling example. The user just has to click on the, the best option. On the right, uh, they go and look at a safety data sheet. There's a link for the safety data sheet there. And then they come back and click on the correct icons to indicate which parts um, were indicated in the safety data sheet. Some other examples uh, down on the bottom left, nursing uh, wanted students to identify where should you stick someone savagely with a needle. Uh, so there are multiple spots that the uh, student is looking for. And again, you can build in feedback that pops up with these things as well. And it will tell them you're looking for 10 different spots. And on the right, this one came from massage where we're asking the student to click on the correct spot to find the chakra for each of those locations. And uh, hotspots can also be used for content. So let's say for instance, here we've got an image where the user clicks on the little eye icons and then some content pops up from that. And then uh, there's a series of questions after it, such as the essay uh, type question. Flashcards, old school, digital style, are really popular with teachers and learners. And there's two main types uh, you can leverage. On the top right there, all the learner has to do is figure out what the answer should be, flip the card over. Really handy when, uh, let's say there might be more than one answer, uh, or perhaps the language skills aren't that great. In the bottom left there, we have another one where, for instance, um, let's say that you really wanted them to spell it correctly. You want an exact answer. So in this case, the, the learner has to type in the answer and hit check and it will flip it over and, and give them some feedback. Now flashcards can be a great alternative to just doing quiz after quiz. It's also great for mastery because sometimes learners become a little bit, um, a bit shy when they're always getting scored on things or when they think you're always being pinged with a notification that they've done something. Uh, so do think of them for any time that you would like students to practice and, and understand things. I was actually really surprised how popular this one was. It's just a word search um, and people love it. Go figure. The tip I would give you for this one is um, I usually provide a PDF version as well. That's because um, there's always someone who still uses Internet Explorer. Don't know why but they do. So in case you've got any browser issues um, or screen size issues, um, then a PDF version can be a great backup for this one. Now let's have a little look behind the scenes, a couple of tips with some of the settings of any of these puppies. All of the uh, H5P activities and content types have display options. Now uh, remembering the awesome thing now is you can put H5P wherever you like. Be nice. With this one, I tend to keep the interface pretty clean. So I disable these options unless I am going to go and embed it somewhere else. 
Um, so I untick these ones, but that's at your discretion. Some of the other settings that um, you have available to you are things like grades. Uh, so I use H5P for activities. I don't use them for formal assessment tasks. So here um, I keep my grader reports clean and neat and tidy and organized. So I tell H5P, hey, pop this into the activities category and this is the grade to pass. The maximum grade's an easy one to figure out. It'll come from your summary slide or if you're using the column tool, just hit all the check buttons and it'll tell you what the scoring would have been. So you can then populate that. Now, some of the other settings that you can look at if you're in the course presentation, uh, surface mode, super awesome. You can remove all of the different types of navigation and put in your own. Uh, don't do that till the end <laughs> until you've figured everything out. You might want to duplicate your activity first and make sure you get a little backup up your, up your sleeve because you can't undo that setting. Um, I mean, as I said earlier, so I untick the show solution on the summary slide. I do allow them to retry to their heart's content. And you might decide to enable the print button as well, depending on what you've got in your presentation. With course presentation though, my top tip is uh, often users miss the, the summary slide and therefore their score won't be recorded. So on the, the last slide of all of my course presentations, I put a little prompt, a little reminder with a little example button there as well, which I actually hyperlink to the summary slide just in case they're trying to click on that instead of the button down on the bottom right. You don't have to. I just um, decided to try and minimize the issues they might experience at the end. Uh, here there's other options with drag and drop. Um, so show title, I actually get rid of that because Moodle already shows the title. So I don't need to have that twice. I'd like a little bit more screen size. Uh, and I do make sure that the user actually has to have a go at things before they can see solutions as well. Told you, I'm mean. Uh, if you're in multiple choice, lots of different options there, just like when you're doing a Moodle quiz. Uh, again, I get rid of the show solution button. You don't have to. A big tip though is if you, let's say, have a question that has five answers, you're looking for three of them, um, I would actually click the give one point for the whole task in that case unless you want them to know that there's three out of five that you're looking for. Again, put what percentage that you're looking for for their pass. Um, and that can be anything that works for you. This is my final thought for today. Uh, so remember, Moodle can help you to create some epically, shockingly wonderful stuff. And so I encourage you to enjoy the moot. Uh, happy Moodling. And uh, you can catch me on any of these channels here. And I'm going to ask Tamara to let me know if there's any questions I need to be answering at this point. Hi, Michelle. We've had a lot of questions come through on the forum. Uh, uh -oh. People are loving the tips and tricks that you've been sending our way. Um, I've just posted a couple in the chat there. Um, but the first one um, is how do you ensure that the interaction works on mobile devices? They've found responsive design a challenge on H5P. Yeah, look, and I agree, it can be a challenge. Um, I view it kind of akin to, you know, you can't test in every browser and every device, but if you, know, if you pick a few different ways that you're going to test and just check things out, and do bear in mind that H5P libraries do update uh, separately to Moodle, so you, you might want to check things again when you've done a bit of an update. Uh, so that's where, you know, I will sometimes do things like check logs to see how many of my users are leveraging, say, for instance, the app, to, and then test a lot, maybe in the app, or are they only using the browser on, the, on their mobile? Um, so there are some activities that I would say probably don't work spectacularly well at the moment on uh, mobile, but a lot of them, if if you think about chunking things down, um, it will work for you. Fantastic. Um, one more here. How can you get learning analytics out of H5P? <laughs> the favourite terminology, learner analytics. Okay, so that will depend on the version of Moodle you're using and whether you're using the plugin or now the integration of it. Um, I can tell you I'm on 3.7 with the plugin. 
um, and I have the best web developer in the world that works with me. And so um, basically our teachers can go to the grader report, click on the um, activity, the H5P activity, and then they can see a report. And that's not something we've built. We've just, I think she went to one of the forums to find out how to do it. Um, so it, it's really powerful for that. I would say though, always put the emphasis on the learner and allowing them to see how they're going. Um, and that's what they really love from that. Fantastic. Um, like I said, there are a lot of questions in the forum, so we might um, have the HQ team and Michelle jump on when they have an opportunity to, to respond to some of those questions. Um, thank you so much, Michelle. There's lots of um, fantastic feedback on your presentation here and some of those great tips. Um, the SA tool in particular looks really interesting, so I'm sure we'll have more feedback on that in the forum. Um, thank you so much for your time. I know it's late there, so we'll let you head off to bed and um, we'll have some time off now before the next session. Thanks again, Michelle. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye.